And uh, thank you everyone uh, for coming along today. Yeah, I'm um, editor of this book and I first uh, read um, Sunset Song in second year at what was uh, Morgan Academy in Dundee. So I'm slightly terrified that the current head teacher of uh, Morgan Academy is here today. So some fears never leave you, do they really, in a sense. Um, and uh, I'm delighted to be uh, uh, talking about this today. I just spoke about it yesterday. Uh, to my fourth years at Edinburgh Napier. Um, so it's great that it's uh, still on school syllabuses uh, now. Um, I'm going to talk about a few things today uh, before we sort of get into the text. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Gibbon himself, uh, a wee bit of uh, background on Gibbon's life, and then I'm going to talk about some key contexts for uh, the novel, or key contexts that are important for understanding Gibbon as well. Some of these might be usable, some of these might not be, but they might be just interesting uh, for you guys um, to know. Gibbon um, wasn't called Gibbon, he was called James Leslie Mitchell. Lewis Grassett Gibbon was uh, a pseudonym of uh, his, which he used to write what we now know of as his, his most famous work, Sunset Song and uh, A Scots Square uh, more generally. He um, was born uh, in 1901, and like Stevenson, who uh, James was talking about there, of course, uh, he didn't live a, a long life. So there's kind of a lot of speculation, in a sense, as to, to what Gibbon would have gone on to do and gone on to write subsequent uh, to these uh, novels. But he wrote an awful lot uh, in uh, a brief uh, life, and most of it under his um, own uh, name, uh, working under his own family name, James Leslie Mitchell, and a lot of uh, novels and, and non-fictional work too, uh, in lots of different genres uh, there as well. And traditionally, uh, critics of uh, Gibbon's work have tended to kind of cast this as the, the English work, uh, because this work does not concern uh, uh, Scotland, generally speaking. Uh, it's uh, set in other places internationally and elsewhere in, in Britain uh, and is not also written uh, in Scots or has any Scots words uh, really generally this, uh, this kind of work. Um, the work that he wrote under much more famously of course for, for us, uh, the pen name Lewis Grass Gibbon is the Scots work in inverted commas uh, and this concerns Scottish settings uh, and has uh, Scots language uh, um, idioms in it uh, or in the case of this biography of the Scottish explorer Mungo Park is about uh, a, a Scot. Now um, Sunset Song is of course the most famous uh, of uh, Gibbon's works as Ronnie said will be out as a film on general release uh, pretty soon uh, and, um, and, it, and it's the first novel in uh, this massive tome, this epic tome of Scott Square. Uh, Sunset Song comes out in 1932. Uh, Cloud Howe follows in 1933. Grey Granite, the conclusion of a Scott Square, comes out in uh, 1934. And Scott Square was kind of united, as it were, as a trilogy in uh, 1946. And um, Sunset Song begins in 1911. Uh, and the, the, the historical stretch of Sunset Song really goes from 1911 till just after the conclusion, really, of the Great War, so the finish of First World War. Cloud Howe uh, takes us through the general strike in the 1920s, and then Grey Granite uh, takes us up into uh, the Depression. And just to talk about Gibbon just a little bit, because he was someone who was um, a radical writer in many ways, and that radicalism comes through, I think, uh, very much in aspects of Sunset Song, particularly in uh, some of the characters of Sunset Song. Uh, born in the Northeast, uh, and a, cro a crofter peasant family, uh, moved to Aberdeen uh, when he was around about 16 years old uh, to work briefly as a journalist there, moved to Glasgow, then also to work as a journalist there. And then when journalism didn't work out for Gibbon, he, uh, he moved on to be in the armed forces. So he served in the Royal Army Service Corps for a while uh, and then in the Royal Air Force as a clerk. Um, he ended up living in Wellingarden City of all strange places for us, for a Scots writer uh, who, uh, who was writing about the Northeast to live. 
And it was when he was in Welling Garden City, he came back to visit uh, the Northeast for a family visit, that his uh, elder brother John uh, suggested that he write uh, about the changing face of the Northeast, really, and try and capture uh, some of uh, what they had understood uh, as that area when he, they were growing up. And it, so that sparked the seed, uh, I guess, of what became uh, Sunset Song. And when it was published in 1932, it was published to quite wide acclaim uh, then, although it didn't make Gibbon popular uh, with uh, his, uh, the natives, really, as it were, of his own uh, native hearth, uh, who recognised many of the characters uh, still in uh, Sunset Song. It's controversial, I think, to some extent, still in that sense uh, today. As I say, Gibbon died uh, very young, uh, really, uh, and, uh, and was uh, someone who, in a sense, also kind of worked himself to death. It's estimated that he was committed to writing a million words in various different projects when, uh, when he died in order uh, to earn a living as uh, a writer. So these are some key contexts, really, I'm going to talk about briefly before I kind of dive into uh, Sunset Song. Uh, uh, one of them, Diffusionism, which I'll explain in a moment. Uh, another one, uh, Scottish Literary Revival, also known as the Scottish Renaissance Movement in its own time. And a third, uh, the Kale Yard. And the last two contexts really are, are related. I'll sort of tie those together uh, before we go on to, to Sunset Song. Now, diffusionism, first off, probably can be ignored, actually, uh, certainly at school level, I would guess, but it's something that's important to an understanding of Gibbon, and it's important to an understanding of Sunset Song and Scots Queer more generally in relation to what Gibbon thinks about time and history and change and the nature of those, because if Sunset Song's about anything, it's about change, uh, really, I guess. Um, Gibbon was interested in diffusionism, and diffusionism was, uh, is, an anthropological theory uh, about uh, the nature of civilization and where civilizations uh, come from. And in his work as uh, uh, James Leslie Mitchell, he wrote an awful lot about diffusionism. It was a kind of something he propagandized for, really, uh, in a sense. It's less obvious, I think, in Sunset Song or a Scots Queer. Uh, but nonetheless, it is there to some extent. And for Gibbon, uh, as a diffusionist, the, the idea was that civilization had emerged in one point uh, in the world, had arose from one point in the world, and that was ancient Egypt, and then has spread around uh, the rest of the, the globe. But the important part for uh, Gibbon in relation to diffusionism is that, as far as Gibbon was concerned, prior to the diffusion of civilization, people had been free. They'd lived in what was a kind of golden age, essentially, of, of freedom, a golden age of freedom prior to class, prior to nation, uh, prior to gender codes, and so on. And that kind of freedom uh, is something that we see to some extent, I guess, in his rendering of those living on the land uh, in a Sunset Song. So it's uh, an interesting kind of context to think about in relation to how Gibbon sees the shifts of history as we move through uh, a Scots Square in particular. Now, another context uh, for Gibbon was the, uh, the historical context that he himself existed in during uh, the 1920s, but particularly the 1930s, uh, when he was writing uh, a, a Scots Square, and that's the Scottish Renaissance movement. Now that was a movement, I guess, for cultural uh, and uh, political change, really, in Scotland during uh, the 1920s and 30s, often seen to be powered by the poet Hugh McDermott, uh, who Gibbon knew and was friends with, and was interested in reclaiming, I guess, a kind of distinctly Scottish voice, but a distinctly Scottish voice with an international uh, concern uh, to it. And uh, Gibbon wrote a book uh, with uh, um, Hugh McDermott called Scottish Scene, uh, which was published in uh, 1934. And they were given various different tasks to write in that book. Some of it's kind of fictional, poetry and so on. Uh, but they also wrote on uh, all four Scottish cities. Gibbon uh, wrote on Glasgow and Aberdeen. 
uh, and McDermott wrote on Dundee, where I'm from, and Edinburgh. And the two of them had not a good word to say about any uh, of uh, the Scottish cities at all. Um, that gives you a sense, perhaps, to some extent, of what the Scottish Renaissance was, which was quite a ruralist movement. These writers were from, from rural places themselves, and they remain tied to the sense that the rural somehow indicated or was part of the real uh, Scotland. But what Gibbon was concerned with in cities, of course, was in the 1930s, poverty. And what he disliked about the Scottish literary renaissance, as far as he was concerned, was the sense that it was a cultural movement for cultural change, and that that seemed to mask what he imagined, or what he thought was much more important than that, was how real people lived uh, in real places. And this is what he says uh, in relation to uh, the Scottish literary revival uh, in the essay uh, Glasgow. And this is a, probably a bit of a stab at Hugh McDermott, who of course was a, a big Scottish nationalist, about nationalism. Uh, and he's, he's saying that uh, Glasgow and the conditions in Glasgow at this time give him an excuse to talk about nationalism. About nationalism, about small nations, what a curse to the earth are small nations. Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Finland, Sal Salvador, Luxembourg, Manchukuo, the Irish Free State, because the Irish had literally just gained their freedom at this point. There are many more. There is an appalling number of disgusting little stretches of the globe claimed, occupied, and infected by groupings of babbling little morons, babbling militant on the subjects unendingly of their exclusive cultures, their exclusive languages, their national souls, and their national uh, genius. So the idea of nationalism was something that Gibbon uh, was pretty uh, opposed to, uh, I guess, in many ways from this uh, Quote, although me thinks perhaps he protests a wee bit too much. And uh, he also says, uh, in, in opposition to the Scottish literary revival, that uh, he's opposed to the focus on culture. Culture is the motif word of the conversation. Ancient Scots culture, future Scots culture, culture ad lib and ad nauseum. And then this is the kind of killer line, as it were. There is nothing in culture or art that is worth the life and elementary happiness of one of those thousands who wrought in the Glasgow slums. So a writer with radical concerns, uh, uh, who seems opposed to what he regards as the nationalism of the Scottish uh, literary renaissance and its concern with Scottish culture. And yet when you read Sunset Song, Sunset Song surely gives the lie to what Gibbon is saying there, because this is about recapturing the nature of a changing culture, a culture that's perhaps disappearing, and the, the words and the songs of that culture as they're disappearing. He seems to be reclaiming that uh, and capturing that in uh, that book. So you can think that in some ways, whilst Gibbon didn't want to be a part of the Scottish Literary Revival, clearly Sunset Song and the Scots Square more generally are absolutely central to many of the kind of aims, as it were, of what that ri uh, revival was about. And one of the things that revival was about, I guess, was um, getting rid of this. Uh, challenging what uh, many of these writers at this time perceived as being the reactionary or provincial or parochial nature of what was called uh, the kill yard, which, of course, I guess the Bruins uh, are still... Uh, an example um, of today. And the kale yard was um, a, 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 a genre, I suppose, of writing in the late 19th century, early 20th century, hugely, hugely popular, written by the likes of J.M. Barry early on in his career, uh, Samuel Rutherford Crockett, who James mentioned, uh, uh, Ian McLaren. Its focus was on small town Scotland, uh, its focus was on a kind of anti-industrial or pre-industrial Scotland. Its focus was on an implicitly Christian uh, and Presbyterian, I guess, community uh, as well. Uh, part of the focus of the kale year was on the lad of Pertz, the talented uh, boy, always a boy, unfortunately, there wasn't really a lass of Pertz who would uh, be able to kind of escape from the community through the help of the teacher or uh, the dominie. And so this is just a kind of definition of what the, the kale yard is or was in its classic form. The kale yard is characterised by the sentimental 
a nostalgic treatment of parochial Scottish scenes, often centred on the church community, often on individual careers which move from childhood innocence to urban awakening and contamination, because the city was a terrible thing for the Kale Yard writers, and back again to the comfort and security of the native hearth. The Kale Yard became um, something that for a, a, quite a while, particularly through the 1970s and 1980s, uh, was um, deemed to be quite a kind of derogatory uh, label and uh, is something that uh, many uh, theorists, I guess, of Scottish culture were kind of worried uh, about. And here's Ian Campbell saying that uh, the kale yard was something that in many ways seemed to retard the idea of uh, the functioning of the imagination in Scotland and Scottish literature for uh, a while. And this was something that the writers of Scottish literary revival seemed to be aware of uh, and wanted to uh, react uh, against in many ways. But yet, as Campbell says there, if we reject the kale yard, you're rejecting much that is things we love about uh, Scotland, like the Bruins or Uruguay, and so on. Now, Sunset Song uh, is uh, a novel that uh, is very aware of uh, the kale yard and very aware of uh, the literary um, inheritance, really, uh, that it takes on. Uh, and um, Gibbon is very canny, uh, I guess, in dealing with that inheritance and dealing with uh, what's preceded him. Much cannier, perhaps, than a writer like George Douglas Brown, uh, who wrote uh, a book called the, the House with the Green Shutters, which was published in, in 1901. And in Brown's novel, which is often seen as kind of being a blast against the kale yard, a way of sweeping away the kale yard. There's not really any good characters in George Douglas Brown's novel. Because the kale yard is saturated with good characters, saturated with sentiment and nostalgia, Brown goes the other way, says to hell with that. No, no, we're going to have this terrible community of Barbie where everyone's gossiping and backbiting, everyone hates each other. And, and the house at the centre of that, the house with the green shutters, eventually must fall. Gibbon um, is, as I say, a bit cannier, really, than, than Douglas Brown and how he deals with what has uh, come before him. And uh, at the beginning of Sunset Song, uh, right at the end of the, the first, um, the opening uh, chapter, as it were, the unfurled field, the, the prelude, we have uh, this uh, quotation. So that was Kinradi, of course, uh, the, the village at the centre of Sunset Song, that bleak, mid uh, that bleak winter of 1911, and the new minister whom they chose early next year, he was to say it was the Scots countryside itself, fathered between a kale yard and a, a bonny briar bush in the lee of a house with green shutters. And what he meant by that, you could guess it yourself, if you'd a mind for puzzles and dirt. There wasn't a house with green shutters in the whole of Kinradi. So this is the minister talking to his congregation, the minister who doesn't really want to be in Kinradi, uh, and he eventually gets out to a much better uh, uh, parish, as it were. He goes off to, to America, in fact. And, uh, but he's read his stuff, and he knows that he's, in, as, as it were, trapped in Kinradi between a kale yard and a bonny briar bush, which is a, a reference to a collection of stories by Ian McLaren, and then the reference to... Um, George Douglas Brown's The House with the Green Shutters. And um, as I say, Sunset Song is a novel that's very aware uh, of a kind of kale yard inheritance. Um, but rather it just uh, uh, than exploding the kale yard, as George Douglas Brown uh, does or attempts to do, um, Sunset Song kind of subtly subverts uh, the kale yard in many ways. And in some ways, Sunset Song, I think, is, is similar, kind of shares a resonance uh, with Laurie Lee's uh, great novel, Cider with Rosie, uh, which was published uh, in, at the end of the 1950s. Because they're both books about change, and they're both books about the loss of a particular way of life and community around about the time of the First uh, World War. Like Cider with Rosie, Sunset Song, it also sees the growth of the main character and uh, the, the main character's sexual awakening. And like Lee's book, Sunset Song has a focus on the land and, and the land's importance to uh, that character. 
And they both do have, I think we've got to admit about Sunset Song, kale yard resonances. Side of the Rosie definitely has kale yard resonances. It was on uh, BBC on Sunday night. That's the kale yard slot on the BBC. <laughs> if there's a kale yard slot, when I was growing up, it was Songs of Praise, Antiques Roadshow, and Last of the Summer Wine. It doesn't really get uh, more, showing my age there, it doesn't really get more kale yard than that. But again, uh, a bit like uh, Gibbon, uh, you know, Lee is, 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 is aware of what he's doing with that and, and, and adds a kind of more sophisticated resonance to it. And like Gibbon, uh, Lee was a radical. Lee went to fight uh, against Franco uh, in the Spanish uh, Civil War. Um, so, um, yeah, Lee's 1959 fictive memoir of his boyhood in a Cotswold village shows perhaps, uh, perhaps even a greater nostalgia than that of Sunset Song for a world where the horse was king and the death of which spells the end of a thousand years uh, life. And for Lee's narrator, the task is to reconnect readers to the beliefs of generations who had been in the valley since the Stone Age and from which, in this emergent modern age of the machine, continuous contact has at last been broken, the deeper caves sealed off forever. So as I say, both these novels do have a kind of kale yardy resonance, the closed community, nostalgia uh, for the past, a rural setting, regional uh, peculiarities, and a huge popular appeal, uh, I think, uh, as well. But unlike the kale yard, uh, Sunset Song offers, uh, as I say, a subversion and a criticism of many things, but primarily, or one thing certainly, uh, of Christianity and especially um, Calvinism. And Chris Guthrie, the main character who I've been in love with since I was 12, <laughs> you know, I revealed that to my students yesterday and they said, you're weird. <laughs> that was the response. That's true, I am weird, but nonetheless, not because I'm weird. Um, Chris uh, does not go off to the city to pursue a university ed education like the Kale Yard ladder parts. Instead, she chooses the land uh, or the land claims and chooses her. Now, there might be problems with that, clearly, uh, especially given that this uh, is a female character who the male author uh, is uh, planting, as it were, uh, back in the land that she has come from. She does not uh, achieve uh, the escape of, say, Martha Ironside in Nan Shepherd's The Quarry Wood, which was published prior uh, to Gibbon's uh, Sunset Song but nonetheless. And Chris uh, is a character that, uh, like her author, I talked about uh, the books that um, Gibbon had published under his uh, own name, James Les Leslie Mitchell, often considered the English uh, novels and that he had published under his pseudonym, often considered the Scottish novels. Chris, like her author, is a character who is split between uh, the English Chris and the Scots, uh, Chris. Uh, and this split comes over particularly uh, in this uh, quotation uh, early on uh, in Sunset Song, which marks out this idea of uh, the two uh, Chrises. So that was Chris and her reading and schooling. Two Chrises there were that fought for her heart and tormented her. You hated the land and the coarse speak of the folk, and learning was brave and fine one day. And the next you'd waken with the peewits crying across the hills, deep and deep, crying in the heart of you. And the smell of the earth in your face, almost you'd cry for that, the beauty of it and the sweetness of the Scottish land and skies. You saw their faces in firelight, fathers and mothers and the neighbours, before the lamps lit up, tired and kind, faces dear and close to you. You wanted the words they'd known and used, forgotten in the far-off youngness of their lives, Scots words to tell to your heart how they wrung it and held it, the toil of their days and unendingly their fight. And the next minute that passed from you, you were English, back to the English words so sharp and clean and true, for a while, for a while, till they slid so smooth from your throat you knew they could never say anything that was worth uh, the saying at all. If that doesn't bring a tear to your eye, you're made of stone, I think, frankly. And when Chris talks about um, the English Chris and the Scots Chris, she's not really talking about 
um, nationality as such. In a way, she's talking about class uh, and the socialization of, of, of class. And Sunset Song uh, is a brilliant kind of um, examination of class in that sense and how it relates to language. James talked brilliantly about uh, Stevenson uh, and language. Well, Gibbon, uh, I think, also has uh, a very subtle ways of doing this. And um, social climbing uh, in Sunset Song is, is, uh, is poked fun at and punctured uh, by the fact that many of the characters who uh, think they're perhaps better than they are uh, try to talk English, uh, proper English, and tend to make a hash of it. Uh, really in that sense. So Scots uh, becomes a kind of marker of, of something uh, somewhat more authentic, uh, I guess. And the Sunset Song of the title, a very kind of evocative uh, title to this novel, uh, alludes uh, to the passing of a culture, really, the passing of the, of the peasant crofter way of life, which is being killed off uh, by mechanisation and is being killed off and is ultimately killed off, I suppose, by the changes wrought uh, by the Great War, not least by the, the death of the men uh, fighting uh, in France for whom there's a kind of valedictory at the end of Sunset Song, but also by the death of the land as tenable uh, farming land because the woods are chopped down uh, for timber profit, which Chase Strachan, one of the, the heroes of Sunset Song, realises when he comes home on leave that the, the, the fact that the woods have been decimated is the end of, of, of them as farmers uh, on this land. So this is also the kind of sunset of a particular local culture. It's maybe the sunset of local cultures per se, uh, in some ways, that Gibbon has captured and, and the words they use and the songs uh, they sing. And, and there's a discussion of this particularly revolving around language uh, at Chris's wedding when she marries uh, the Dour Highland Brute, uh, Ewan Tavendale. And uh, Long Rob of the Mill, one of the book's heroes, again, another uh, of the book's heroes who's an atheist and initially a conscientious, uh, conscientious objector in the war, uh, lauds the use of Scots words. He calls it Scotch. Uh, and while another character, Gordon, says that if folk are to get on uh, in the world, they must use English. So progress and commercialism are demanding a kind of standardisation uh, of language. But, but nonetheless, Gibbon, of course, in Sunset Song, is capturing many of those Scots words uh, that are being uh, lost. Just as a, a kind of a, an aside on this, sort of from a teaching uh, perspective, um, as I say, I taught uh, Sunset Song just yesterday and, and, and asking students whether they enjoyed this novel, what they liked about it, what they disliked about it, and so on. And, and some students who are not uh, native Scots do find this quite hard. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I tend to think this is mostly written in English, Sunset Song and a Scots queer, uh, but they, 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 they had a sense that actually some of the Scots kind of blocks them and shuts them out. I guess that's something... Uh, to be aware of uh, in, in some ways. Now, the song of uh, the, the title, Sunset Song, is partly, I guess, uh, Gibbon's magnificent uh, prose, which adapts the, the lilt, really, of the Northeast, uh, where he's from and where the novel is set, to, the Eng to English, with some Scots words uh, used throughout. But the song is also specifically the song, The Flowers of the Forest, uh, which is mentioned a couple of times uh, in Sunset Song. And, and The Flowers of the Forest was originally a song which was a lament for those uh, Scots who had died in the Battle of Flodden in 1513. Uh, and Chris sings The Flowers of the Forest at her uh, wedding uh, night. She sings it as her turn, as it were. And then the song is then later piped again by the Highlander MacIver, who's Ewan's best man, at the conclusion of the, the, the novel uh, as a remembrance of uh, the dead uh, in the First World War. So the flowers of the forest in Gibbon's hands are the last of the peasants. Uh, they're not just those men who have died in the war, they're also the last of the peasants, the last of the old Scots folk and the last of their culture and their uh, community.
<clears throat> now, song uh, in Sunset Song is, const is contrasted with speak. Um, Gibbon uses this, this word quite a lot. Uh, it was the speak of the place, the speak of the Merns, the title of a, an incomplete, uh, un, uh, unpublished in his own time, uh, uh, Gibbon's last novel before he died. And, and the speak uh, is gossip, uh, which both kind of divides and binds uh, the community of Kinradi. And again, in that sense, he's learnt something from George Douglas Brown's The House with the Green uh, Shutters. This is a narrative uh, sunset song which is where, in which voice is important and which the narrative relates both to the, to the speak and the voice of the folk. So there is an idea that there is such a thing as a kind of folk culture which in many ways uh, the, uh, the narrative is uh, narrating. And often in sunset song there isn't really a kind of third person narrator, as it were, looking down on the community and telling us what's going on and pulling the strings of the characters. Uh, and you can see that um, even in uh, this passage that I've got up here in relation to the, the, the two Chrises. I mean, the first sentence starts off, so that was Chris in a reading and, and schooling, two Chrises there were that fought for her art and tormented her. Sort of traditional third person uh, narrative there. Then we move straight into this, you hated the land, and the course speak of the folk. So the question is, who's you? And who's speaking when we have that you? Is that Chris speaking for herself? Is that a narrator talking about Chris? And, and how does that relate Chris to the reader? It's almost as if Chris becomes the reader, and it's almost as if, in some senses, the reader is planted in the community of Kinradi through that you. Uh, and it's almost as if uh, we become part of the community, or even that could be someone else in the community. It doesn't necessarily have to be Chris. So this you is quite a kind of, kind of communitarian way of narr uh, narrating uh, the community. So the second person, both singular and plural in, in that, that you, is important in how uh, Gibbon deals with the folk voice uh, that he is trying to narrate and trying to capture, both in its good side and in its bad sides, I guess, the gossip, the speak uh, of the folk. <clears throat> so gossip speak is part of, uh, part of the kind of oppressive side of this community, but um, the, the, uh, if there is an oppressive side, which I think there is to the, to the community, it goes beyond mere gossip. And Sunset Song is... Uh, a book largely about the malign influence of religion, uh, specifically Calvinism upon the community of Kinradi, uh, which the Reverend Gibbon, uh, note the surname, calls a rotten kale yard. And John Guthrie, uh, Chris's father, um, looks at her lustily like a caged beast. He paces outside her bedroom during the harvest madness. He bids her sleep with him as they had done in Old Testament times. Chris's mother, Jean, kills herself rather than face yet another pregnancy forced upon her by Guthrie's religious beliefs. And our children, Dodd and Alec, are taunted at school. Dafty, Dafty, whose mother was a Dafty. Not very PC, is it, the use of the word Dafty, I guess. But the Dafties are actually key to understanding some of what's going on in this community. There are two village dafties specifically. There's a lot of madness in Sunset Song. Lord Kinradi goes mad. Old Putty, the blacksmith, eventually goes mad. Uh, and, but there are two dafties um, in Sunset Song, Andy and Tony, and they're key to understanding the madness which overtakes the community in the grip of a kind of Calvinist religious uh, repression. Andy who appears to be genuinely mentally disturbed, runs amok uh, one day through Conradi molesting girls. Whereas Tony, who is described as having once been a scholar and written books and learned and learned till his brain fair softened and right off his head he'd gone, uh, so there's a lesson for all of you, is more insightful as to the nature of his own and the community's malady, calling, calling the local minister only a half-witted cleric. And he greets Che Strachan one day, one of the community's few genuinely good characters, Che's a, a socialist 
who of course believes in equality, and Tony cries to Che enigmatically, I Che, so the mills of God still grind, which completely throws Che. Now the mills of God still grinding, this is a proverbial saying really, and it has kind of classical antecedents, but it's used by the American poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in a poem called Retribution. And the retribution, really, that Kinradi's suffering of a world gone mad in war is what tears Kinradi apart and kills a generation of peasant farmers. And it's suffered by the community through uh, being ministered to by a hypocritical religion that renders learning and, uh, a futile, mere dirt, uh, is, is often what the, many of the characters uh, in Sunset Song called learning, and that renders love shameful as well. But Andy and Tony are kind of holy fools, really. And it's significant that Andy bears the name shortened of Scotland's patron saint, Andrew. And he's kind of the perverted sex instinct, really, of a country inhibited by Calvinist doctrine. Whereas Tony is a kind of mystic, really, St. Anthony. Uh, and he represents a kind of repressed spiritual intelligence, really, of a community that's somewhat lost its way. Uh, in the material temptations of the modern world on its road to, to war. Now the one constant in Sunset Song and in a Scots ha a queer in general is the idea of uh, change. Whilst many of the male characters, and this is perhaps another um, topic for discussion I, I guess, while many of the male characters hold on uh, to certain ideologies. Che uh, is a socialist, Long Rob, uh, an atheist, John Guthrie is a, a, a liberal. Um, Chris, throughout Sunset Song and throughout the queer uh, as a whole, uh, is less keen to kind of pin herself to any particular uh, ideology, any particular belief. Uh, and the thing that is her constant, really, uh, is the idea of the land. And when she thinks about leaving to become, to go to university in Aberdeen and become a school teacher and so on, she has a kind of um, epiphany, I suppose, uh, that this is something that she can't do, uh, that she must uh, stay with the land. And again, this is another kind of set piece quotation uh, rendering that epiphany uh, real to her. So this is Chris um, thinking, I guess, that nothing endures. And then a queer thought came to her there in the Drukit fields that nothing endured at all, nothing but the land she passed across, tossed and turned and perpetually changed below the hands of the crofter folk since the oldest of them had set the standing stones by the loch of Blawiri and climbed there on their holy days and saw their terrace crops ride brave in the wind and sun. Sea and sky and the folk who wrote and fought and were learned, teaching and saying and praying, they lasted but as a breath amidst of fog in, the, uh, fog in the hills, but the land was forever. You were close to it and it to you, not at a bleak remove it held you and hurted you. And she had thought uh, to leave it all. So Chris is connected uh, to the, the rhythms uh, and seasons of the land with each of the chapters named after an aspect of the farming of the land, which also relates to her personal development and her awakening ploughing, drilling, seed time, harvest. Uh, something we could read again in a kind of sexist light, the land as female, even Scotland uh, as female. And also she is connected through time to previous, <coughs> excuse me, often pre-Christian selves. Again, it's very significant that Chris, uh, at times of contemplation, will go up to the standing stones, pagan standing stones, uh, in order uh, to think back on what has happened to her and in order to be able to uh, face uh, the future. Thanks very much. If you've got any questions, feel free to... <laughs>